Spartans, the podcast of all of your favorite Halo podcast. I'm your host, Oren, and today we have a very special interview for you to start off 2020. Joining us today is Scott Brick, an actor, writer, and audiobook narrator. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for having me. It's fun getting to, uh, getting to talk about these books. They've been a lot of fun to work on over the years, so it's nice to, uh, nice to be able to chat about them. Yes, uh, you've had, you have quite a track record um, in the Halo narration, audiobook format, and uh, we'll kind of dive into that as well, kind of learn a little bit more about you, and as well learn about the audiobook production and sort of pipeline and that t- whole industry that, that I think our listeners are interested in learning about. Also with us on the panel, we have Aaron. Hi, guys. So to kind of just kick things off, Scott, if you just want to kind of briefly tell us a little bit about just kind of generally who you are and then kind of how you're connected to the Halo universe. And we'll go from there. Sounds good. Um, I've been an actor pretty much my whole life since uh, leaving UCLA mumble mumble years ago. I was a theater student there, um, was out auditioning for, you know, film, TV, stage, what have you. About 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago now, a matter of fact, I know the exact date on June 10th, 1999. I wrote it down in my date book and I checked it years later. (laughs) <laughs> on June 10th, 1999, I recorded my very first audiobook, which was a thrill. And my God, it just took off. And 20 years and about 900 books later, somewhere along the way, I, I don't remember how long ago it was, maybe five years ago. It was about about five, four, five and a half. Yeah, I started doing video game audiobooks. And I, you know, I used to play video games all the time when I was a kid, but I hadn't played in years. And First, I was approached about doing the um, the World of Warcraft books. I did maybe a half a dozen of those, maybe a dozen, I don't recall. And then it was like, oh, you can do those. How about you do the Halo ones for us, too? And <laughs> that was really a lot of fun. And I've been working with the same producer ever since. And then every time every time another one comes down the line, we, we share the same email chain. We always say, uh, hey, we're getting the band back together. <laughs> My connection to the Halo universe is tangential. I don't do any of the voices in the, in the game, obviously, but when they novelize certain adventures, then, uh, then they come to me. Well, that, that's a great introduction because that hits on uh, many different sort of topics that I wanted to touch on today. But yes, in short, you have 13 novels to date, or I guess between novels and short stories with the Halo universe, and we'll, we'll dive in to those very shortly. But I wanted to touch on your early, early acting career. Just after graduating from UCLA, you joined a traveling Shakespearean theater company, and you did that for almost a decade? I did, on and off for a decade. Will and Company. It was a, it was a traveling Shakespeare company. We were booked out of the Music Center in Los Angeles. It was an equity production, but my God, it was, uh, it was a hard way to make a living because we were performing for schools, primarily in California, but uh, in some of the surrounding states as well. And my God, you know, waking up at 4 a.m. so that you could be, you know, three hours away, uh, getting there at 7 a.m. and swinging a broadsword when you're playing Macbeth, uh, doing that at 8 a.m. <laughs> for, for a class. Oh, that was a young man's game. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was a thrill. I mean, it was the first time I got to, um, you know, there comes a moment in, in professional actors' lives where you stand up and realize, hey, I'm a professional now. I'm making my living doing this. So that was a thrill. I have uh, glorious memories of my, my Shakespeare days. Do you return to the stage or any type of more, I guess, physical acting as opposed to uh, merely the audio? Sure. You know, it's been about, oh gosh, it's been at least 10 years since I've been on stage. And I think about it all the time. Matter of fact, I was talking to another audiobook narrator, Mark Bramhall, about doing my favorite production of all time, my favorite story of all time is Cyrano. And he and I started chatting and he says, you know what? I'd love to direct you in that. So, you know, who knows? It'd be wonderful to be able to do it. The problem with stage work is, especially if you're doing a a show like that, that's three hours and you're yelling for quite a bit of it. Act four (laughs) takes place. It's it's on a battlefield. So being, knowing that I, you know, either will or won't be able to record the next day, uh, you know, it would, Doing a performance, you know, late the night before would make it difficult to sound like myself the next morning. And, you know, speaking for eight hours in the studio might be a little problematic. So, so which is why I haven't done more of it in recent years. Right, right. And 
looking at the sort of stage, uh, sort of theater field and the heavy reliance on vocal performance and with monologues and projection and all that, uh, it seems to be a very fitting sort of transition to kind of go from there and having a very distinct audio quality when you do your type of narration voice acting. Was that transition as kind of straightforward as you would think it was? Or did you also have to kind of take additional maybe voice training to then make that transition once you opened yourself up to the audiobook field? It's interesting because I didn't do any extra training to become a narrator, but I started thinking about different storytelling mediums in a new way. In my own personal history, there had always been, there'd been this, um, it was an either or situation. There was a paradigm. You were either, if you were on stage, you were projecting to the back of the house so you could reach somebody in the last row of the audience. You have to be much bigger on the stage, obviously. But when you're in front of a camera, whether for film or TV, it may only be six feet away, maybe less. So I was thinking, okay, I either have to be big enough to be seen, you know, 50 yards away or small enough to be seen five feet away. Well, when I got into audiobooks, it suddenly occurred to me, I'm not, I don't need to project at all. I mean, the listener, in many ways, when you think about it, especially nowadays, you got lips, microphone, earbuds, you know? I mean, there are times where I can whisper, and I often do in an audiobook. You can be so much smaller and convey much more than you, than you realized. So that was the main adjustment I had to, I had to think about, was uh, don't keep acting for, you know, five feet away. Don't keep acting for the camera. Get right in on the mic and realize that's where the listener's ear is. So then when you're diving into a new book and during your audio recording, do you give yourself some of that play to kind of decide, you know, yes, you're you know, maybe even a foot away from the microphone, but given your, your, your voice and kind of maybe this ties into the characters that you have to kind of bring to life, do you have that sort of play and creativity to then kind of find these different ways to tell the story before you, I guess, go in and, and record the final version? I do, yeah. We're, we're given a certain amount of leeway and a certain amount of trust by both the publishers and the authors that we work with. I mean, essentially, what it is, is I'm, I'm being, my job is to interpret the story. You know, in the old days, you had the author's words and the reader's brain, and the only thing in between was their eyes. Well, now you have the author's words and the listener's brain, and I'm between those. I am interpreting the story, hopefully in such a way that will, that will make you use your imagination, not going too far, not doing too much of the work for you, but inspiring you to, to think about it. And, and, and as you always do when you read a book, is you, you, know, you imagine these scenarios for yourself. How does he look? How does he sound? So it's, it's, it's the same thing. So in these situations, they trust me to interpret the story, so I look for those times when I can get really close to the mic and be, you know, when does it help to be small? When does it help to be bigger? There's a wonderful series. It was on, uh, Fox did a, a, a TV show last year, The Passage. And I did the trilogy that it was based on. And it was just absolutely marvelous. Just one of my favorite series of all time. And there was a character who is referred to in the first two books they call him Zero, but you don't know who he is. He's basically, he's the first vampire. And when I did it in the first two books, you know, the only lines that he has were all subliminal. They're, he's speaking, you know, telepathically. He's getting, he, you know, people can hear him whispering in their head. And he, he says the same thing all the time. He says, come to me, 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 come to me. So I got really tight on the mic. I was almost kissing the microphone and I did it that soft. Well, in the third book, you find out who he is. And at one point, there was 160 pages written from his perspective. It, it changed from third-person narration to first-person. And I thought, oh, my God, what a great opportunity. You know, people who have listened to the first two books are expecting that voice. And so I spoke with the publisher and the director, and I said, uh, Christina Rooney is her name, and I said, would you be okay if I did all 160 pages tight on the mic like that. And she was like, Ooh, that'd be cool. <laughs> so, so that's what we did. And uh, it took about two days and I, and I all, all but whispered it, you know, it helped that the character was, was a very affected kind of larger than life character. 
So, you know, he says to this woman who finds him, he says, so you want to know who I am? You want to know my story? Very well. I shall tell you. And I just, it was so much freaking fun. I'm like, oh. just hit him right, right, right in the, in the creepy zone, you know? When you get tight on a microphone like that, we call it the proximity effect because it sounds like somebody is whispering in your ear. So that's, that's really all I did. So, yeah, I do look for opportunities to do that where it will serve the story. I don't want to do something that would be inappropriate and take you out of the story. Job one for me is to of make course. sure you get the author's words you know, exactly the way that they were intended to be. Right. And you, and you kind of get sucked into the story. And, and I think often some individuals who turn towards audiobooks as their kind of primary source of, of reading or digesting a novel is, is they may have trouble keeping their attention, following the words and, and kind of digesting it. Their mind might trail off in, in ways that kind of gets them out of it. So to have that, you know, that type of powerful voice and, and the, the compellingness of it can suck you in. So then you're focused and you're in that world and you're kind of encapsulated into it. So yes, I, I, I definitely see that or hear that rather. To kind of go back to kind of the processes and in still a more general sense, when we've spoken to authors of, of kind of the Halo books and, and like any sort of author and franchise sort of uh, relationship, there's definitely a dialogue there to kind of make sure that the story that's written is is kind of within the realm of of the franchise and the universe, especially in, in fantasy and sci-fi. And you kind of mentioned a little bit of that already with with the Passion series. Is is there as much as a kind of dialogue throughout the recording process, or is it maybe an email chain or a coffee lunch sort of interaction? Um, and then you guys, and you kind of go away and do your thing. We primarily handle it through email, and it's it's really interesting because. There's a number of stops along the way. There's the author, and I rarely, if ever, find out where they're living. Uh, but then you have the publisher, the Simon & Schuster. They, they're based in New York. And that's, so that's the producer who gets in touch with me and says, we want you to do this. But then there's the people whose full-time job it is to oversee the game. And I don't know how it is with them, but I remember when I was working on the Warcraft books, their job description, their job title was lore master, which I freaking nice. love. I freaking <laughs> love that. You know, so what do you do? I'm a lore master. That's what I do. And, and it's their job to make sure that there, are, there is a consistency throughout all of the platforms, the storytelling platforms, whether it's right. the game itself, online, videos that are being made, audiobooks. They have to make sure that I am pronouncing things accurately. So... What typically happens, the author finishes the job, I uh, get sent off to the publisher. It's usually about a year after the, pub, um, the author has finished their part of the work that the publisher is ready to record the audiobook and, and, and the print version is coming out as well, or the ebook. And about three months before the book comes out, they send it to me. We pencil in some dates. Then, the, you know, the, when I start looking at the script, I have to go through and find every word that I don't know how to pronounce. And... It's not even just a situation with like, you know, Yanme, you know, or, you know, the Jerohana, you know, whatever it is. It's not even necessarily something to do with, you know, the lore of the book itself. Or, or with the source material, it just might be a, a strange, obscure English word. <laughs> exactly. It could just be an obscure English word. You know, I, the first time I saw uh, Macadam, I was like, wow, I'd never said that word out loud. I thought it was Macadam. What the hell did I know? You want to make sure <laughs> that nobody is hearing you going, really? Mac you know, Macadam? Yeah, sounds like you went to college. <laughs> so I go through, we do a word list. Sometimes if I'm really booked, you know, this, this recent time, it was hard for me to, to, to get the uh, most recent one done. So Mike Noble, the producer, he went through and he created the word list. That word list then goes off to the game masters, to Microsoft. They look it all over. They check and see, you know, they've done, they did a lot of these before I came along. They check and see if this is something that we've covered in a previous one. I have all of the pronunciations that they've given me for all of these 13 books on my computer. So I'll check that list and say, okay, I've already got that one. You know, Yanmei, great. That's, that's taken care of. For everything else, everything that hasn't been done, they create individual MP3 files, sound files that they do, and they just speak just that one word or the name or whatever it is. They're three or four seconds long. 
but I've got hundreds of these. And is that hundreds just for the Halo universe? And then you have hundreds just for of the Halo universe. For other? Uh, right now, I've got 580 of them. Oh, goodness. Wow. From all of the various titles that I've done. I do, I keep just this comprehensive glossary because, again, sometimes we might miss something as we're doing the, uh, the word list. But hopefully, it's something that I've said in a previous book and I can go back and hear those sounds, hear those, those files. And it's much more slow going. If I would ordinarily, depending on the length of the book, if the length of the book is such that, you know, any other, any other book I did of that length would take me four days to record, quite often it's going to take me five, sometimes six to do this because we are double checking our pronunciations constantly. The last thing I want to do is disappoint the fans. So would you say a kind of average average book takes anywhere between about a week or a little less? Usually. Given the length and maybe the complexity of the word list? The average book, and I'm not just speaking of a Halo book these days, but the average book that comes out right, right. is about 100,000 words. That's going to translate into about 11 hours. And I aim to get about three hours finished per day. So... 11 hours, if I really pushed it, I might be able to do that in four days, but odds are I'll, especially if it's going to be, you know, something as work intensive as this, I'll, I'll make it five. So earlier you mentioned a script. So do you, do you get a straight up copy of the, the bound book or do you get maybe an edited type of script or manuscript that kind of is just presented in a different form that's easier for you to read? I, they send me a PDF and quite often when they send it to me, it's the first pass they usually do at least three revisions. We call it the recordable. Is the recordable in? No, but we've got the first pass. Well, they'll give me that first pass so I can at least do the word list. So you can kind of do the work beforehand and then when the first the first readable is ready. Exactly. You, you find out what's going on. The revisions, yeah, they're going to come, but they're not going to be so drastic that I won't recognize the story on the third draft right, from the right. first. That helps me. And then as soon as the recordable comes in, they send it my way, and that's when we jump on it. And then for post-production side, if, if you kind of know the ins and out of that, or, or actually, I guess, backing up a little bit, when you, when you record, you, you give yourself a cadence for, I guess, how, how you interpret the story and all that, but is there, are there also methods and different, not necessarily tips and tricks, but I guess just um, conventions that you use while recording to make, I guess, the, the editing, whoever's doing this, the sound editing, kind of able to do their job a little bit more easier? Because I, I doubt there's, you know, you kind of give it and pass it off and they just hit, you know, <laughs> export. There's, got, there's some form of, of editing in there. I'm, I'm having trouble kind of asking just because I don't know, but are you, in, in short, are you able to kind of outline what the post-production editing side, once you're done with your re re recording? There's the, uh, I'm happy to, there's the part that I do, and then there's the part that the publisher does. I have a general idea what the publisher does, but yeah, I can tell you more my process of this. I'm basically going to give them a cleaned recording. What that means is we use a we use a a technique called some people do the punch and roll. And what that means is if I'm recording, if I'm if what I'm saying now is written in front of me in a script and I and I mispronounce a word or my my uh, my voice flutters just a little bit, you know, at the end of the day or lack of hydration, you know, suddenly you can sound a little reedy. Your voice gets just a little thin. If that, and that usually happens on maybe one word or two, and then it goes back to normal. Well, I have to go back and fix that. So what I do is I stop recording. I go back to the beginning of that sentence, and I just punch in from there. It's basically, it's editing on the fly. When you know you've made a mistake, you go back and you fix it. So that's basically what I have committed to them that I will give them. So there's not going to be a ton of editing, at least in terms of taking out additional takes that I've done. They're, they're going to have to do editing, but I'm making it as easy for them as I can. I don't do the punch and roll method myself. I used to, but I just, oh, God, I hate it. So it's much, <laughs> much better for me creatively to, uh, I, I learned this trick from a number of friends of mine who do voiceover more short term, short form voiceover. And that's you go and you get a tally clicker. And you see people, you know, counting when lines go in at a, a sporting event or a, a concert. I got one here in my hand. You can hear it. When that happens, when, that, when you hear those clicks, I'll see a visual representation on my screen because the, uh, the waveform 
the line going across like a cardiogram in a hospital, that's going across my screen right now. And if I don't say anything, it's a flat line. But if this happens, well, that's five spikes. My editor, the engineer that I hire, is going to go and look for those and take the take after it and butt it up to the take before those spikes. He basically just cuts out everything in between. So you essentially do your own punch and roll without stopping your recording. You kind of, you, you, you just back up and... I finish the files. Uh, I finish my recordings. I'll, I'll do uh, each chapter file is, you know, basically one. It's one individual file and I send it off to my engineer. He cleans those up, sends it back to me within 24 hours. I then send it off to the publisher. Now, the publisher is going to still have to go through it and and do the editing. Sometimes, you know, there's clicks. Sometimes they don't typically edit out breaths, but sometimes if, if, if your breath was a bit ragged on that take, well, they'll, they'll turn down the gain on that. Again, I, I've only got a general idea, having not been an editor myself, right. not working directly for the publisher, not being in the room when it happens, but I know that they're, they're looking for the little things like that. Once I've taken out all the all the, all the uh, additional takes, they're going to go through and do the really important stuff and make sure that it sounds okay. It gets sent to one of the biggest parts of the process is sending it to a proofer, and that's the QC, the quality control. And that's somebody who is going to be looking at the PDF that I, the same file that I recorded from, and they're going to be listening and reading at the same time to make sure that I am word perfect, that I don't, that, that, that nothing got missed. And uh, paying especially close attention to all of the words that come along that were on that word list that, that, uh, that the lore masters have sent me. <laughs> right. And the pronunciations are all correct. So that, that, what, that happens from the publisher. The publisher does that, I want to say, twice. They have two rounds of it. First round, okay, great. We had, uh, it's a 12-hour book. We have 18 pickups for you to do, as they're referred to. Pick this one up, record it. I send it back. They put it into the final recording. They get it proofed again. If there's any more pickups, great, I do them. Then they send it off to, to the Halo Masters, basically. Uh, the people who work on the game, the people whose job it is, full-time job it is, to make sure that this is consistent. Those lore masters I talked about, they then have to do the, the, the final round. And sometimes we get lucky and there's no, there's no changes to be made. Sometimes there's a few. Uh, there's nothing been ever, you know, huge or drastic. Right. But more likely like it's a, it's Yan Me eh rather than Yan Me eh. You know, an <laughs> S sound versus an A sound, that kind of thing. But again, that's, you know, it takes longer, but I love that dedication. I love the, the care that they put into it to make sure that this is as the fans know it, as close as we can get anyway. You know, I'm not going to sound like the voices in the video game. You just have to kind of accept that. Right. Like like Master Chief and, and Cortana and all them. Like, you know, it's not Jen Taylor and Steve Downs. Exactly. Um, although, on that point, though, I don't, I don't know if you are aware of this, but the, um, for the Cryptum, or not Cryptum, it was Primordium. It was the, the second novel in the Forerunner saga. Mild spoiler alert for our listeners, but the, the story's character that tells, that, that, that speaks the whole story, his point of view... Uh, the voice actor from the game actually did the audiobook, and so at the end of the novel, when it's revealed to be this character, if if you didn't already kind of, I think he kind of changes his voice and his sort of enunciations a little differently until his kind of character transformation at the end of it. But from from kind of a fan point of view and kind of knowing that kind of insight, uh, it, it just makes it feel just a little bit more grounded into the universe um to kind of have that that close of detail to the uh to the story and the way it's told i can only imagine when i have something when i'm dealing with a character who is you know very well established they don't send me sound files they don't send me you know outtakes from from you know the recording the, the game recording but i will go on youtube and look things up just to find out just very simple things is this character's voice typically you know higher pitched, maybe more nasal in quality? Is it much lower where you kind of, you know, you start getting down into the, like, you know, the scraping sound like I'm doing now? I can at least do that. And I try to be as consistent that way as I can with, of course, the, the caveat that I'm never going to sound exactly like them. 
Do you, is there a method that you keep to make sure that your voices are consistent throughout any sort of novel? Like if you're dealing with an ensemble of characters for, say, it's a murder mystery or something, and there's 12 different suspects, do you try to get a uh, identifiable voice for each character, or do you kind of just pick the main characters and, and kind of make sure that those voices stay consistent, or whoever the narrator is uh, for the story? Well, you can do it basically one of two ways. I do both. In Pro Tools, which is the software that I'm using to record, you can drop in markers. And if a character is introduced on page 20, and I'm reasonably certain they're going to be, you know, I, I know because I've read the book, and I know they're going to come back on right. page 320 and be really important to the story, I drop a marker in there so I can, anytime I need to, I can go back and listen. Or sometimes what I do is I will write myself some shorthand notes. Uh, I learned this from a dear friend of mine, Pat Fraley. He did... Uh, the voice of Krang in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he's a legend in the voiceover business. He and I, we teach voiceover classes together, and he will write himself these shorthand notes saying, okay, this guy right here, no, he'll say, like, this woman, this woman's voice, it's it's George Bush Sr. with a lisp. Yeah, just little, <laughs> little, little crazy things like that. And I remember working on a vampire series years ago, and he had this uh, uh, familiar that was uh, this character that was absolutely wonderful, but he was so, he was this drug addict, sleazy guy. And I just thought, oh my God, he's so twitchy. It's like Joe Pesci. And, and so I just wrote that in, in, in my notes and it was never, I never had to go back and actually listen to any of those markers that I dropped in because that kind of shorthand for me anyway, for my process, I'm like, oh yeah, I know that voice. Uh, one more question before we dive kind of into the more specific Halo questions. For audiobooks that incorporate maybe uh, some music melodies or sound effects, I think there was one Halo novel um, in the earlier era of, uh, of novels where they kind of had some battle sound effects while they described the battle that was taking place. Do you, do you have any opinions on those type of post-production edits to accompany voiceovers? Do you think those add or do you think they distract sometimes or i gotta be honest i have never gone back and listened to one of my books and not any of the halo books not any of my books that i've ever recorded so i honestly have no idea what gets put on them afterward but i listen to a lot of audiobooks and you know it's a fine line there's you know this is a book this is one person reading you something or, or if there's several pov characters they might get as many different actors as there are points of view characters nevertheless it's the, the listener knows it's not an old-time radio broadcast. It's not uh, a dramatization. So I honestly don't know other people's, you know, um, preferences. When I listen to an audiobook, times I, I don't want anything. But other times when people put things in, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I, lo I mean, I love old-time radio. So, you know, it, I think ultimately, ultimately it all comes down to personal preference. And kind of the story that they're that they're saying, because yeah, I, I, it doesn't happen very often, and I can't really recall it happening in recent Halo novels. But I or Aaron, do you, are you do you maybe know it might have been at the Ghost of Onyx, or maybe even the first Halo novel, Fall of Reach? I think it's it's the Cold Protocol. It uh, it has a couple of times where it gets into they'll have like a dramatic battle section, and suddenly uh, uprises the like dramatic guitar music and a few things <laughs> like that. It it happens a few times, but. Then again, they did a few different things in like the early Halo novels because they seemed to bounce around. You only ever had a narrator for maybe three books and then they moved on again and then they just picked yourself and went with it and it's been kind of nice and consistent because sometimes you'd get between narrators and you'd find that the name of a species changed in the early books and it would it would bounce back and forth. So a bit kind of like the routine, the system they go through now seems to work for them because it's all pretty consistent these days, which is nice. You know, and I couldn't thank you. And I and I couldn't say whether that whether that's changed any, you know, because again, I wasn't involved in the franchise from the beginning, from those first audiobooks. But I know look, the the buzzword these days in audiobooks of all kind, but especially these that need a lot more care, is consistency. Listeners hate change. I know I do. I don't like it when narrators change. You know, I'm I, I, I'm a book fan, an audiobook fan, just like you know other people are, which is why I've saved everything they've ever sent me, every reference piece that they've ever sent me, because I want to make sure that I don't start d doing it differently. That that if I'm not paying attention, it suddenly shifts. 
I, I learned that lesson. I've done 20 books in the Dune franchise, uh, starting with Frank Herbert's original six and then tons of prequels and sequels. And I've got almost, gosh, I, I, I don't remember. I, I want to say I've got about 2,500 words in that audio glossary. You know, the fans deserve it. They deserve that consistency. Even if it's extra work for me, that's fine. I'm curious, while you're talking about extra work and consistency, do you ever find any voices or anything you do in the Halo novels particularly taxing? I know you do a particularly good, like, raspy, grumbly, deep, brute voice, but is there is there anything like you find at the end of a recording session you're just done for the day? Uh, yeah, it's that voice that you were talking about, you know, when I have to do, when I have to do the brutes, there are times, and I learned this from Jim Dale, who did the Harry Potter audiobooks. He couldn't do Hagrid's dialogue on the same day as the rest of the recording. So he would read everything else except for Hagrid's lines. And then he would do, he would read the attribution, you know, the part of the sentence that came after the quotation marks that said, said Hagrid with a laugh said Hagrid to Harry, said Hagrid to Hermione, whatever. Uh, he would read all of those during the week. And then on Friday before going home, in the hour or two at the end of the day, he would get into that, you know, oh, Harry, you know, that kind of, that kind of voice. And he would do <laughs> the dialogue only. And they would splice it in. They would edit it in with the attribution he had read days before, you know, oh, Harry. And they'd do the clip and then, you know, the click and then it'd be like, said Hagrid with a laugh, you know? And that was genius. And it gave him the weekend to recover and be able to be good to go the following Monday. And uh, I just thought, wow, that's where skill becomes an art. You know, when he just realized, OK, this is my limitation. I've had that several years ago, five years ago, I think right at the beginning of when I was doing the Halo books, I had to have my thyroid removed and they stretch your vocal cords. Your laryngeal nerve sits right on top of the thyroid. So they had to stretch mine is in order to to get to the two lobes uh, you know, on each side of the throat. And my, 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 my voice was thrashed after that. So I told the publisher, I said, I'm not going to be able to do that book next month. You have to get it to me early because I just will not be able to do that voice. And they were, my God, they, they were wonderful. They did everything. They were, just went above and beyond so that I could, I could do it at a time when I could that really a brute voice going. So yeah, working with them has been a dream. Uh, Aaron, do you have any other sort of questions you wanted to add that kind of talks about the audio book recording process? Or do you want to dive into some some Halo knowledge? I think we can dive in. I think we've covered most of it now. Like I said, it's just, I was always curious about when I listen to an audio book, sometimes I'll notice a point where you can hear two different sessions in a recording with occasionally, but then I sit and wonder, how many splices have I missed during the last half an hour that I've noticed this one? You know, how many takes have been cut together seamlessly that you can never tell? So it's it's always fascinating. It might be a matter of, you know, what you had heard previously was at the end of day two, and then the next take is at the beginning of, beginning of day three. Because people's voices warm up every day, which is why I don't typically record first thing in the morning. I wait. I, I, I wait until my voice is warm. I wait until I've had, until I've hydrated a certain amount. I have two liters of water before I even sit in my booth because I know it, that's what's going to make me able to speak eight hours later is that, is that all the water drinking I've done early in the morning. I'm curious just actually while you say that, what is your routine for looking after your voice? Like it is the money maker at the yeah. end of the day. So I'm curious, <laughs> how, how do you like, how do you look after it and maintain it? No sh streaming concerts or screaming uh, sports games. <laughs> it, it's really funny because my girlfriend, Suzanne, she's a narrator as well. God, she's been, uh, she's been in the industry for five, six years now. Suzanne Freeman is her name. And we both do much the same thing. You know, we'll be out on a date and it's like, okay. We're at Dodger Stadium and my team just hit a home run. I don't yell. I don't go, yeah, you know, don't do it. We'll be in the car. You know, great song comes on the radio or, you know, we'll be playing something off our phone and I don't sing along. Well, now that's no real great loss, but, you know, certainly no, uh, uh, no karaoke singing either because it's, for me, for us, it's preventive medicine. I have to make sure that I'm going to be able to record tomorrow. Beyond that, it's primarily water. For me, it's hydration. And uh, a few other things like I use a lip balm to make sure my, my lips don't smack and I don't pop my peas. I've got a pop filter between me and the microphone. So in case I do you know, pop a pea really 
really hard, those uh, pop filters quite often will uh, will lessen it. Yeah, kind of diminish the uh, the spike. So to date, uh, like we mentioned earlier, you've produced 13 audiobooks for the Halo universe. First one being from 2014, Broken Circle, which is, I wouldn't say is one of the more popular Halo novels, not that it's bad by any sorts, but it is rather obscure. It dives deep into the Sangheili sort of foundations and how the Sanshayun came up and formed the Covenant and then how it eventually sort of broke apart. Was was this novel your introduction to the Halo universe? It, absolutely. I had never played the game. I still haven't. I'm so busy. I don't have time. It was the same way when I was doing the, uh, <laughs> the Warcraft books. I didn't have time to go and play the game. And I knew I've got, oh God, I love video games so much that I knew if I ever started playing, boy, that would be a, <laughs> that'd be a hole I would never emerge from. Once you get sucked in, you'd have quite a backlog to kind of exactly. go through and get caught up. So, yes, it was. And the producers, again, I, I can't say enough about uh, Mike Noble. He's just gone above and beyond. It's so funny. I was saying earlier, you know, all the, st- the steps in the process. What I forgot to mention was that our editor, Fenn, he's in New Zealand. And it's so really, this, these projects just bounce all over the globe before they arrive in your Audible app or however you're listening to it. But, yes, everybody along the way, everybody w- was... All those steps in the process, everybody was helpful to me saying, okay, this is how it's done. Okay, let me do this voice. Well, the way it's been done previously was this. Okay, great. I'll, I'll do my best. I'll, I'll, I'll try to accommodate. And it's really been wonderful, especially being on the series long enough now that when I see certain books are clearly a sequel of one that came out, you know, two years before. I'm like, oh, great. I've been wondering what happened. It's really been nice to, to have that continuity. You know, I have to tell you something. One of the coolest things that's happened to me while working on these books was when I was asked to do, um, God, I want to say this was a few years ago now. I'm looking it up here. Uh, looks like I did this one in, yeah, I did this one in 2016. Halo Fractures, which was a short story collection. Yes. I didn't realize, but a dear friend of mine, uh, somebody, I, I, an old friend of mine, somebody I'd known for decades, Uh, actually wrote one of those stories. It was John Jackson Miller. And he wrote the story uh, Defender of the Storm in Fractures. And John is a guy who I knew from when I was a professional writer, when I was writing articles about comic books and science fiction and toys and games. He used to work at Comics Buyer's Guide. My favorite article I ever got to write, I pitched it to John and he was like, oh my God, great. It was uh, Who Killed Gwen Stacy to find out whose idea was it? How did it happen? I got to interview all of the usual suspects, everybody who worked on the issue that was still alive at the time. And uh, John, man, he just transformed it. He made that whole issue about that one story. So I will always, man, (laughs) John Jacks Miller is going to drink free forever in any bar that I'm in. And all these years later, you know, he had had quit the magazine game to be a full-time writer. And I just, it was was like a blessing in my life. It was like a privilege getting to record one of his stories in my new career. In audiobooks. So on your on your website, um, or actually, did you do the audiobook for Into the Fire and on Fractures? Did you because you did eventually do Smoke and Shadow and Into the Fire? I think was kind of the first couple of chapters of that of that same novel. So I'm sorry. W- was was Into the Fire in Fractures? Into the Fire was in Fractures. Yes, and, yes, I did. And it's it's kind of the prelude to the full length novel Smoke and Shadow. And, I th- and that's what that's what some of the stories were in Fractures. It was kind of the anticipation and the lead-in to either a full-fledged novel or I think it was kind of like a, almost like an in-between story between two novels. It was like a launch pad, uh, launching on, on, point. Yes. But on your website, Smoke and Shadow is under your Scott Picks sort of section for science fiction and fantasy. And you also have your Dune and Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep which is the, the, the foundation for the film franchise Blade Runner, as well as Atlas Shrugged. So is there something about Smoke and Shadow as you were reading that that really you really enjoyed for that story to kind of put it in the same league as, as these other deep sci-fi san- uh, fantasy novels? Well, the thing is, is when I, when I do those picks on my website, uh, something you have to know about narrators, we always fall in love with the books that we're working on now. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, this is my new favorite okay. book. Wait, I thought that was your, old, you know, your new favorite book. Well, it was, but now this one is. 
when I wrote that, uh, when I when I came up with that list, we had just done that book, and I really, yeah, I was, I was very impressed by it. But also, in terms of you know sci-fi, I do my best on my website to say, okay, if you like mysteries, take a look at these. If you like science fiction, take a look at these. But people who like mysteries, the Raymond Chandler novels are going to be a lot different than the mysteries by Greg Hurwitz or Nelson DeMille. You know, there's such drastically different styles that I try to have a rep- you know, I try to make the list representative of all the different types of, you know, even sometimes even like subgenres. Right, right. I thought, you know what? I really wanted to put a, a Halo book up there. And it was. It was my new favorite when I was working on it. So I was like, yeah, I want to put that on there. Well, I, according to my list here, you, you didn't record the sequel to Smoke and Shadow, which was called uh, Renegades. Um, and that was, that's, a, that's one of my personal top favorite um, novels within the Halo universe. So if you ever get around in your free time to, to read that one, I think it's a good sequel to kind of dive into. And it's, uh, never, been, it's never been recorded. Oh, I think it has been recorded. Renegades, and I think it's the Battleborn books, they switch to a female narrator for both of those because Renegades is all from the point of view of the female lead character's way. I wonder, did they just want to switch over to that? That's, you know, that's the thing. You, you tip, the, the audiobook industry is very gender and ethnicity centric, right? So if a book is being written from the perspective of a, of a black man, they're going to get a black man to record it. If it's a, a, a Chinese woman is the POV character, they're going to get, you know, an Asian woman to record this. But it's primarily, it's, uh, it goes by, by gender. If the main character is a woman, it's going to be very rare when a man narrates it. I did on the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant uh, because the last four books are written primarily from Lyndon Avery's uh, point of view. But I had done the previous six <laughs> books in the series, so they, you know, <laughs> it was like, well, let's just go ahead and stick with what works. But yes, that, that I can totally see why, that, why they would make that change. I'm curious, when you talk about like a publisher sticking with what works with a narrator, how, in terms of Halo, like I don't know how much you can talk about, but like, did they sign you up for a few books as a deal, or did they just come back to you and say, we like this narrator, we keep this narrator? I'm curious how you've ended up with 13 of them. You know, that's, that's just the way it's been. It's, it's, it's like always a one-book contract. I mean, certain, certain authors that I work with it doesn't usually happen on the publisher's part, but certain authors I work with, if they switch publishers, they've got it in their contract that I'm I'm going to be doing their audiobooks, and and that's always that's really nice. I, it's happened with uh, a number of different publishers. They've said, "Great, you know, welcome into the fold. Keep doing these books for us." But it's not usually done from the publisher's perspective. They won't come to me and they say, "Hey, you know, we want to re up you for a dozen new Halo books, you know, over next Five X years. many years, right?" Yeah. Uh, well, in many ways, look, Bob Bergen, he's a friend of mine, and he's the voice of Porky Pig, and he has been for over 20 years. He auditions every year, every single year he auditions for it to make sure he's still the best man for the job. And, you know, look, I think that totally works, you know. If I wasn't the right man for the job, then they should they should get the right man for the job. So I'm I'm fine with it. Have you ever auditioned for a, for a narration audiobook? Oh, sure. Yeah, it happens all the time. And you kind of get just a section or like a few pages or one chapter and kind of record. And, and then I guess the, the publisher then listens to see. I mean, that makes perfect sense. I don't know why I didn't even, I didn't, <laughs> I'm acting surprised. Well, it's funny because sometimes I'll audition and I won't even know that I'm auditioning. And what I mean by that is this happened years ago with a, a series by Janet Ivanovich. She has had these best selling novels, the Stephanie Plum novels, again, for decades. And Laurel I. King narrates them. But she wanted to start a new series called the, the Fox and O'Hare books. And it was m- more from the point of view of a male uh, lead. And so I walk into um, the publisher's studio one day and I get told, hey, good, good news. You landed the, uh, the new Janet Ivanovich book. And I said, what? I, I'd never heard of it. You know, and they said, <laughs> yeah, you know, the audition went really well. I'm like, what audition? I didn't audition. What they had done is they had taken, uh, they, the publisher, knowing what type of book it is, they would go and they would find a book that I had done in a very similar vein. And then they might go to, you know, Ray Porter. They might go to, 
you know, Simon Vance. He's British, obviously, but, you know, uh, uh, nevertheless, you go to, you know, some of the usual suspects in the industry and you say, great, what are the books that they've done in the similar genre? And they grab like a five minute sample and they send them to the author and they make their decision. I had that happen about a year, year and a half ago when the Jack Reacher novels became available. The previous narrator, Dick Hill, retired. And, oh, my God, I was a massive fan of that series. And so I was on pins and needles for a month while the authors, you know, Lee Child, while they're making their decision. And, you know, sometimes you book them, sometimes you don't. And sometimes you don't even know that you were up for it. So it's kind of funny. That is interesting. Yeah, you, you do have or, you know, a literal resume that you can, that people can, can listen to and kind of decide uh, for themselves in their sort of searching process. So do you uh, do you have a personal favorite uh, Halo novel that you've narrated? You know, I I don't. Or is there, or does it kind of just keep changing as you get the next one and then, oh, that's my favorite until the next one? That happens a lot. I really have to say it does. It, it just, uh, I love, look, I, I grew up playing video games, playing Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, and, and I love this idea of a shared universe. And... Much the way nowadays, you got the James Bond novels. I mean, these novels have been going for 50 years and new authors are contributing to it. I'm like, I just love the fact that the story is ongoing, that we get to hear more. So every time a new book comes along, I'm like, oh, so that's what happens. I've been wondering. Great. I'm in. I'm hooked. Is that sort of the the same sort of mindset for like the Dune series, for instance? You said you narrated 12, I think 12 stories within that series. Are there? I think there's been 21 so far. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's like getting to, you know, learning what happened to Duncan Idaho after Chapter House Dune. (laughs) That's marvelous. I spent 20 years wondering what was going to happen. Finding out and being the first person to find out because, you know, sorry, I record these three months before everybody else gets to see them. I want to go online so bad and say, look at me and do my like my happy dance going, I know what happens. I know what happens. But I can't do that because that'd be really unprofessional. Right, right. I'm sure there's uh, NDAs and stuff against you as well. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, you asked about favorites. I, I did. I, I, I really have a, a, a fond spot in my heart for that uh, short story collection and getting to work on John's short story and Fractures. Now, the short story sort of, you know, there's just those collections. I think that that's the second second or third short story, as well as just a few short comic book stories that 343 have done. And, and it's great to get these bite-sized pieces that are throughout the Halo uh, universe and different time periods, because it's so interesting that each time period is so distinct and different and different conflicts and characters to then go from that or focus, you know, for 11 to 12 hours reading one story. It's, it's a nice breath of, of new air to kind of get those, uh, those stories out. That's kind of the end of, of my list. Aaron, are there any other sort of questions that you would like to ask Mr. Brick before we get to some community questions? I suppose I could throw in the old. Do you have any character voices you've ever been particularly proud of? Does anything jump out at you? Just Are any characters you particularly find appealing? In the Halo universe, every once in a while, I'll find a bartender or something, and, and, and I don't. I don't want to, oh gosh, how, how best to put this. I don't want to make the story about me. If, if, you know, look, if a review comes out and all they talk about is the book, is the author's work, I'm happy. I feel like I've done my job if they don't even talk about the work that I did. And one way you can really hijack an audiobook is to do, you know, huge character voices and uh, something like hugely recognizable. But years ago, I got to do a book in a, uh, it was a Stephen R. Donaldson book, and there was a character called The Bill. The Bill was as smarmy and greasy and just slimy a character <laughs> as, as I could be, as, as you can imagine. And he called himself The Bill because, I'll never forget it, he says, I'm called The Bill because, you see, I am the bill that you pay. You're not getting out of here until you pay <laughs> the bill, right? And he was just, it was so much fun. And every once in a while, and I've never forgotten that character. Now, even though that's a totally different universe, it was a sci-fi thing. It took place on a space station. So every once in a while, I'll be doing a, a book and there'll be like a scene in a bar. And if the bartender has lines, I make him the bill. 
I, I it's just too, it's, it's too much fun for me. But that usually I can only get away with it if it's like a five and under uh, on a TV show. If somebody's got five lines or less, that's how they're referred to, a uh, five and under. If they got like five lines of dialogue or less, I can get away with it. Because, yeah, we have, we have a nice little moment and then the story then continues and doesn't get too distracting. Exactly. Well, very good. Well, we have just a few questions from from three community uh, members here. Lucas is uh, curious what your favorite non-Halo book would be that you've narrated or maybe franchise if you can't fi- pick a specific novel um, that you've narrated in the past. But I kind of touched on that earlier that your favorites tend to fluctuate. <laughs> sure. But nevertheless, I do have my favorites. Uh, you know, how can you not? There are a lot of novels that I could point to. I think at this point I've done over 900 of them. And yes, I, I, I dearly, I dearly love the Dune franchise. But speaking as a fan, I discovered the books when I was in, I was a freshman in college. And I will never forget sacrificing my first quarter at UCLA, sacrificing my finals week, because I couldn't take the time to study, because I had to know what happened at the end of Lord Fowl's Bane. The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever by Stephen R. Donaldson, are, they are my favorite books of all time. And about 10, 12 years ago, I, 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 I got, we got to do the new books in the series. They were coming out, The Last Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. And in 2006, I think a new book in, that, in The Last Chronicles was coming out. And it wasn't going to be done. It, wasn't going to be done. it was called um, a Fatal Revenant. And I went to the publisher and they said, yeah, you know, first one didn't sell well enough for us to do the second one. It just financially just wouldn't be viable. And I said, can I do it? And I paid them for it. I paid for the the rights myself. I then went back and I bought the rights to the first six in the series. And ultimately, uh, with a number of different publishers help, we were able to get all 10 books on audio. And I am as proud of that series, the work I did on that series as I, as I can ever be. I actually think I I, I might record them a little bit differently today, being where I am now in my career. You know, uh, things have changed a little bit, but I've done those, a book here and there of those 10 books, you know, every couple of years throughout my career. And they're still my favorite books of all time. So, uh, and as a matter of fact, I I sold them for many, many years directly on my website. They're still available there, but we just, uh, we just signed a deal with Audible. So they're now on Amazon and uh, Audible and iTunes and wherever fine audiobooks are sold. Yeah, I'd have to say those are my favorites. Well, very. I, I think that's a very uh, worthy achievement, and congratulations on that. That's that's something definitely to be proud of. Um, one of our community guests, Orion, not a question, but he just wants you to know that his wife really enjoys listening to you read the Halo novels. Oh, that's very kind. <laughs> so, I appreciate uh, it. Thank very you. Very excited for this episode. I have to tell you a, a funny story. It didn't even happen to me, but George Guidel is a um, master narrator. God, he's done over 1,200 books. Been doing it for 30 or 40 years, like one of the grand masters of this industry. And he told me a story one time. He said um, he was at a, at a signing someplace, speaking at a library, and said, um, and a guy walks up to him as he's signing copies of something. Guy walks up to him and says, you know, I'm really glad to meet you today. My wife has been raving about you for years. <laughs> He says, really? He says, uh, yeah. He says, you know, she just goes on and on about George Guidel and how handsome he must be. But now I meet you when I feel a lot better. <laughs> so, sorry, I had well, to, I just, yeah, I just flashed on that. Uh, you, you never know. People will say the craziest things to me sometime. A, a woman in front of my, my girlfriend, Suzanne, we were at a, a mystery conference recently, and a woman came up to me. She was in her 70s, and she says, I just want you to know, you are the only man other than my husband that I have taken to my bed for the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and that's quite flattering. It really is because, look, I, I can laugh at the way that it comes out sometimes, but at, at its heart, it's when people, it's like that person there, that man who passed that along. At its heart, it's somebody just sharing their appreciation, and it's, it's lovely to hear. I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, I, I've listened to most of the books on audiobook just because of, of my time availability and, and my commutes. And you being the, the kind of front runner for the, the recent novels, you've, you've accompanied me on my commutes uh, more than anyone else, I'd say. Well, I'm grateful that you took me along for the ride. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's been a very surreal episode having the audiobook talk back to me. It's uh, <laughs> it's unusual. <laughs> so Ian wants to kind of touch on a question we I think we touched on earlier about your different voices. Um, is there is there kind of prep work that you go into differentiating different uh, male, female, or in Halo and Sci-Fi's case, like AI voices that you kind of go to? I know you touched a little bit on it earlier. Are you able to expand on that? It's interesting. Uh, this is, again, something I learned from Pat Fraley. Voiceover artists, quite often, they'll have a, um, a cast of characters, right? They'll have their professor voice, and they'll have their scientist voice, and they'll have their leading man voice, and then their, uh, their woman protagonist voice, their femme fatale voice. And quite often, it's somebody that you fastened on when you were growing up. Uh, when I when I do a scientist, quite often in my head, I'm doing a, a character actor from an episode of The Twilight Zone called The Long Morrow. And in it, he's he's telling this uh, Commander Stansfield that he's about to ship out to this planet and he's going to spend 60 years, you know, 30 years in cryogenic suspension. And he'll be awakened when they get to this, when they get to this planet. And he says something like, perhaps we'll call it Stansfield's planet. And he just had this just wonderful timbre to his voice. And I've never forgotten that uh, from when I was a kid. And so now when I do a professor, I'll quite often make him that actor. I wish I, I, wish I knew his name. I, I have, and I've, I've asked colleagues of mine, you know, other narrators. I said, do you do the same thing? And I, there, boy, there are certain people who've got like, there's narrators who have one, uh, male narrators who have one woman voice. And then there's others who've got like six. And they can pick and choose and see, you know, <laughs> which, which one fits this best. I have got a lot of stock characters in my head, and I will quite often cast from them. It's more a mental thing than anything else. I will, you know, again, I'll, I'll make recordings of, of how certain characters will sound. But again, like going back to the Dune universe, the most recent project we did, it was a short story collection, Stories of Dune, available currently. And in it, Erasmus, the robot, basically the, the AI, the evil AI, he came back and uh, made a and made an appearance. It was a, like a prequel kind of situation, and it had been a decade since I had done that voice, and I didn't even have to think about it. I just knew exactly how he sounded. <laughs> Other narrators are different. Other narrators, bless her heart, Katie Kelgren, she passed away three years ago, I believe it was now, but um, she would she went th- to so much length creating brief clips. You know her as certain characters reading reading their lines of dialogue. And she had them loaded on her iPad. And every time one of them made another appearance, she would just, you know, pause the recording, tap the iPad, and she would hear her own voice doing that character. And I, I guess I'm more of a, it, to me, it's just, it's a mental process. I, I see their name and I, I can hear their voice in my head. Very interesting. It seems that you connect with other narrators quite frequent. Do you guys have not necessarily conventions or anything, but are there, are there outlets for you and other narrators to to meet and discuss and talk, or is it just kind of through the through the travels and throughout the time that you've been working that you've just developed these relationships? I have to say that some of the narrators in this industry are, are my closest friends. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I'm dating one of them, right? <laughs> but like you know, Ray Porter, he's a marvelous, uh, marvelous at science fiction marvelous at everything, but I listen to him doing science fiction. I'm listening right now to uh, We Are Legion, We Are Bob. He's one of my closest friends. He's, he's, a, he's a, dear, a dear dear pal of mine, and we'll get together and we'll go to a bar every now and again. And there are get-togethers that we, that we all have. There's a, a conference, a publishing conference that happens in New York every year, uh, the Audio Publishers Association Conference. And there'll be a hundred narrators show up, and we'll all get caught up. But there's an L.A. contingent. There's got to be at least 50, maybe, no, more. There's got to be 100 narrators that live in L.A. alone. And so what I'll do is every year I host something for, for the union, SAG-AFTRA. I'm part of their steering committee for audiobooks, uh, audiobook negotiations. And so I just I host a potluck every year. We do it at the end of summer, uh, early fall. And I'll have 100 people out in my backyard, you know, barbecuing or just getting caught up and yeah that we take the opportunity to talk about work and you know how do you approach this what do you do in this situation that kind of thing that kind of stuff always comes up well very very interesting 
listening to you talk about audio production and sort of the audiobook realm. Aaron, I think that's kind of all that we have in store for, for us, unless you can think of any anything to kind of wrap up. But I actually realized that as I was talking about those recordings that they made me, I have them here and I can play them. Oh yes, I meant to I meant to ask. Yeah, that'd be a great way to send off. Let's let's listen to a few either alien races or planet names or something that you have in store for us. Sounds great. I, I grabbed these at random. As I say, I've got okay. you know, several hundred, but these are the ones that I've listened to over and over and over. Here we go. This is the word uh, Cortana. And I'm, again, I'm going to guess at the pronunci- pronunciation. I seem to remember it was Cortana, but let's find out for sure. Cortana. Yay, I got that one right. Okay. There you go. Then we got, uh, moving alphabetically, we've got Gao. Let's see. Gao. And again, these are the voices of the lore masters that you're hearing. <laughs> again, I, they may not call themselves that, but that's what I, that's the way I right, think of right. them. Right, right. No, they, we've, we've been in communications with, with several of, of them as well over the years and, uh, the different sort of like franchise writers, I think are some of the titles that they have, uh, that kind of keep the, uh, the lore in check. Sure. Well, it's so funny because there's two guys who uh, every recording that I've ever received was done by one of these two guys and uh, those two voices that you just heard. And I've never met them. And I feel, I, I really kind of want to because I'm like, oh, man, I've been listening to you for years, which is so funny because that's what people say to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> man, you have been helping me. It's I don't even think they know what a huge help this is. OK, here we go. I'm trying to remember how this one's pronounced. Kasha Hylot. I believe. Let's find out. Kasha Hylot. Okay, that's different. Kasha. It's not Kasha. It's Kasha Hylot. And getting the uh, getting the uh, the syllable stress correct makes all the difference. Okay, Kasha Hylot. And the last one, Yanme'e. 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 Yeah. So, yeah, those are just a few. I think this is the greatest thing I've appreciated because I started listening to the audiobooks back when we started this podcast, because if we were relying on me reading the books, we'd never record anything. I'm just very slow. Um, and it was kind of scary the first time I listened through a few audiobooks and went, oh, I, I pronounce all these words horribly wrong. <laughs> it's just like, I've read these for years. And then you're going, I can't say this out loud. I have to change how I say these now. That, that's probably been the most beneficial thing before I made an idiot of myself online. Which happens regularly, to be fair. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting because again, I've I've worked in the Dune universe and the Thomas Covenant universe, and especially when you've got a series that has been around for decades, fans kind of take ownership. In many ways, the series belongs to us. At least that's the way it feels to us. And so, yeah, you've got like the pronunciations. This is the way I've always done it, and that was a huge difference for me, a huge shift for me when I realized that. Wait a minute. Hang on. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, um, OK, yeah, uh, left up to me, If like in the Dune universe, I would say Harkonnen. But for Frank Herbert, it was Harkonnen. He, he uh, the, that, that, the word Harkonnen was, was at its, you know, at the, the base of, of what he thought of, you know, for these, for these characters, for this noble family. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? That is more important than any kind of ownership that I'm claiming in my head. So every time since... It's Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, and it's 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 helpful when we do our book club series after after a new novel comes out and we all read it and we talk about it on on this show. Um, we there there is a divide between audiobook listeners and physical book readers <laughs> within our little panel, and we'll Aaron and I will always say, "Oh well, you know the audiobook narrator pronounces it this way, so this is how it's pronounced," and we kind of have that chip on our shoulder a little bit, so it always invites some some fun debate. A little bit of pushback, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Scott, this is this has been an amazing hour talking with you. Like you said, you have been told over the years. Uh, we've been listening to you over the years, and uh, being an audio podcast show, I imagine a lot of our listeners uh, feel right at home that listen to audiobooks as well. Is there is there anything you want to share with with us and our listeners that's going to be upcoming with you, or maybe what your latest audiobook that I mean I don't know if you know which one came out recently since you record them all three months in advance or however much, but is there anything you want to plug or or advertise so to speak? Yeah, you know, um, I'm I'm really excited 
I know I've mentioned the Dune universe a lot in this podcast because I know I'm speaking to members of my tribe, the other science fiction fans. I, the only book in the Dune story, and I use that word specifically in the Dune story that hasn't been told, is the story of Frank Herbert. But over 10 years ago, almost 15 years ago now, Brian Herbert, his son, who took over writing the franchise with Kevin J. Anderson, um, the prequels and the sequels, Brian wrote uh, this lovely biography of his father, and he called it Dreamer of Dune. And it's, to me, it, it, you know, we did, we did the saga, we did the Dune saga, but to me, there's more. There's the Dune story, how it came to be, and how this man, God, how he formulated all of this, how he... We talk nowadays about world building, but we did, they, it wasn't called that back then in 1960 or whenever it was he first started working on this. And there's been a lot of attention paid to the franchise recently because there's that, uh, the, new, the new version, the new film is being made. And I cannot wait for that to happen. And Brian and I, we, uh, we have been working on getting Dreamer of Dune done on audio and uh, it will be available by the time the movie debuts. Hopefully, in the next uh, six months, we'll be uh, we'll have it uh, ready to go. Maybe mid uh, mid twenty twenty. It's been a, it's been a labor of love, uh, certainly for him, uh, but for myself as well. Very good, very nice. Yes, we'll we'll be checking that out. I'm looking forward to the Dune film as well. Um, as a quite an all star cast. Oh so man, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep that on our radar, Scott. Yes, is like I said, this has been great. Um, we we love interviewing uh, all the different sort of individuals that are connected to this uh, ever-growing franchise of uh, Halo. Uh, I recommend to you, if you do have the time, to listen to Halo Renegades, judging from how we've been talking, um, that that novel is uh, is a very strong addition to the Halo universe. Um, and like I said, it's a sequel to Smoke and Shadow, if you remember and recall that story. I'm actually excited because I never knew that they that this book existed. I Sadly, I, I pretty much I, I only know what, what happens if I'm asked to narrate it. Right, right. Getting to hear that there's going to be more of the story that I'm not aware of, that'll be wonderful. And finger, fingers crossed that there's a, there's a third one to round out the trilogy. Nothing confirmed yet, but, uh, but given where the story goes from at least a lore point of view and, and what we try to interpret from it, it has some good implications on what could come in the, quote, present timeline of uh, Halo and the Master Chief. But for our listeners, thank you all for listening. This has uh, been Podcast Evolved. You can find us at halopodcast.com. Uh, we'll be continuing um, our interviews throughout the year, as well as our mission debrief segments and our road to Halo Infinite when that releases later this year. I'll, yeah, Scott, the new Halo game comes out the end of this year, so you have a couple more months to uh, play the other five-plus games. <laughs> Man, there's a lot more of the story to tell. Can I say one, one last thing, if I may? I want to thank both of you guys for having me on. This has been an absolute pleasure and a, a privilege to get to, get to talk uh, directly to the listeners. And I just want to say thank you to all of them, to all of you listening to this. I'm really, really grateful. Audiobooks has been the best thing in my life. Everything good in my life I got through being an audiobook narrator. And uh, I'm hugely grateful every time somebody gets in touch and says, you know, thank you. Hell, even times when people get in touch and they're like, yeah, I didn't really like your work or, you know, I didn't like this book. I still, I thank them. I say, well, I appreciate you giving it a try. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Anytime somebody, uh, somebody picks up something that I've worked on, uh, I'm thankful. So I just want them to know. Well, I, uh, that, that's very flattering. Thank you as well. And like, we, we can't wait for the next one. Um, we're, we're, <laughs> we're anxiously waiting for whatever novels are coming out in 2020 with this being a big year for Halo. So hopefully you're, you're slated on, on one of those or very soon in 2021. Jeff and Frankie, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know the email address, you know who to call. Well, with that, um, Scott, if you want to join us at the end of all of our episodes, we, we kind of, um, we don't shout, but we kind of just have a good hurrah. Uh, we say evolved if you want to join us. And we'll, with, with that, that was our episode. And until next time, everybody, Evolved! Evolved. <laughs>